Hey guys, what's up? It's Lizzie Jane and we're back with another episode of the podcast. I have two lovely individuals joining me today. Their project name goes by Gem and Tari. I know you know of them and I'm so excited that we finally had the chance to sit down. Courtney and Emma are absolute sweethearts. They are part of the Ophelia family. They just finished a massive tour with Seven Lions. I think it was over 40 dates. They played Brooklyn Mirage, Eco Stage, some of the country's most vast venues. And they also completed their first headline tour this past winter, which is so exciting. They are working on new music. They have new festival sets coming up. We talk about their creative process, their new EP out on Ophelia Records and everything else in between. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'm so glad that we just completed that massive live series and we are back to regular programming. This is Lizzie Jane. I hope you guys have a wonderful week and you are tuning in to my podcast with Gem and Tari. Hey guys, so lately I've seen a ton of larger shows I've been playing at that a lot of these festivals and venues are no longer allowing bags that are not clear. Well, guess what? Lunchbox Packs is coming in clutch again. They have just stepped up their anti-theft bags by releasing a fully clear hydration pack and snack pack. This is an absolute game changer for your summer festivals and events. Each bag is made out of TPU material that is incredibly durable, flexible, and made to not alter under extreme sun exposure over time. You also have the option to bring a skin in your bag on the way in, and once you're through that security line, you can zip on your skin for privacy of your belongings and to add some extra personalized fun flair. These hydration packs meet the majority of all festival regulations and guidelines. As always, these packs have all of the awesome anti-theft features as the original hydration and snack packs. Make sure you use code Lizzie Jane for $10 off any hydration pack and code Lizzie J for $5 off any snack pack. I will see you at the rave. The show today was brought to you by Vitaplur E-Boost Gum. With no pill to take or powders to mix, Vitaplur E-Boost Gum is a first-of-its-kind energy rave supplement that provides magnesium, electrolytes, and antioxidants while you chew. Vitaplur is the perfect complement to my active lifestyle, whether it's at the festival, on the road touring, or hitting the gym. Chew Vitaplur and dance with confidence. Use code LizzieJane for 10% off any order. Emma and Courtney, thank you guys so much for joining me today. I'm speaking with Gem and Tari. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And as I said before, like, so happy we finally got to make this happen. I love speaking to other women, especially when they're women producers and artists. And you guys have just been all over so far this summer. And I feel like we're just getting started, um, you know, doing almost every date on the recent Seven Lions tour to doing a bunch of headline intimate small shows. I mean, how have you guys been feeling? Has it been exhausting? Has it been exhilarating somewhere in the middle? Yeah, it was my first tour, so I didn't even know what to expect. But the bus tour was incredible. She did amazing it for was, her first bus tour. Thank you. It is exhausting yeah. and it, it <laughs> does wear you out. And there were low times of... uh you know, it gets kind of crazy emotionally when you're just going constantly and just club after club after show, no sleep, you know, because <laughs> no the, <laughs> the driver is driving through the night and it's like, you know, it's bumpy. And so you're trying to sleep, but you can't really. So it was nope. interesting, but I learned a lot about myself and we try to eat as healthy as possible and, you know, stay on the right track, but it was really fun. And I am mostly grateful for the exposure I think it went really well and I think we did really well together and that was too it was fun yeah I feel like touring whether you're on a bus or you're going plane to plane is always kind of this thing as an artist that you strive for and then once you finally get to that position and point where it's like hey we're joining 40 dates of a tour we're joining this and that you go okay I'm ready and then you learn what exactly what you just said so much about yourself you <laughs> learn that it's yeah. next to near impossible to keep you know a good sleep routine a healthy like meditating and eating routine all in one it's like a give and take kind of situation but the memories and the places you go and I feel like being on 
a bus tour is so much more of an experience than yeah. flying city to city because I feel like with that, like, yes, it's so much more of an investment being away from your home and your friends and your family for X amount of time and not really going home. But with that, you get the upper hand of not worrying about catching a 4 a.m. flight or not yeah. missing a flight or dealing with, you know, security at X, Y, and Z airport. And you just get to wake up in that next city and actually like experience it for what it is, which is always so mm-hmm. lovely. I can't, I did, when I was in a band, I did one mm-hmm. bus tour and then, but I haven't done one as a DJ yet. Cause obviously it's, I feel like it's a different type of like situation and not traveling with a bunch of instruments and gear and backlining and all of that stuff. But I feel like it's always just so fun. Do you guys have little cats? Are there little cats running around? Yeah. I love it. Thanks kitties and two dogs. They'll probably pop in and out. I love it. You'll probably see my crazy husky potentially like fly over my head with like a toy (laughs) during the meeting. Like we'll, we'll have podcasts sometimes or I'll be in a meeting and she'll just kind of like come up on my futon and like put her paws on my shoulder. And I'm like, this is great. This is great. guys. (laughs) So tell me about like first, how you guys met, have you guys always kind of like aspirationally wanted to produce music and tour as DJs or was this something that you guys kind of developed in your love of being involved in the electronic dance community or like just for people listening who aren't crazy familiar with you guys maybe aren't in tune with the Ophelia family and Jeff and everyone like give us a little bit of a background yeah um we we met at a Burning Man party in 2018 Um, not at Burning Man, but it was like a fundraiser in Seattle. Um, and I, I feel like over the years of touring with Jeff, I always thought it would be fun. And, you know, I would do like little pop-ups with the boys when I was on tour with them. Um, like we would open rooms before the first opener Mm -hmm. and I always thought it would be fun, but I have like terrible stage fright. So I was not getting up there by myself. Um, And then Courtney came around and one night Jeff needed an extra opener. Someone just didn't show up. And he was like, you guys have music on a flash drive. Like, just go up there. And so he sort of just like threw us. I was stoked. (laughs) I was terrified. (laughs) Because I had been like, DJing house parties for friends and stuff, but I never really thought I would make a career out of it. But it's funny, ever since I was a little kid, like I remember my uncle teaching me how to spin records when I was like 12 years old. And I was like, I just want to be a DJ. That's all I want to do. <laughs> but I guess I'll do real estate because that's what my parents <laughs> did and whatever. Mm-hmm. So this opportunity has like totally opened up this new creative aspect of my life that has just made me so happy. Um, because music is my favorite thing in the world. And it's fun being able to share it with everybody. And we were just DJs for a while. um, And I never thought I was even going to learn how to produce. It's such a can of worms to open up. It is so complicated. Like, and I've never really been a musician. I'm not like naturally a composer. I don't think I never, I learned the drums when I was younger. Emma did too. Um, We've played things here and there. I'm trying to learn guitar, but I very much was thrown in the deep end. We both were. And, um, to make it in this business, you have to make your own music too, kind of. So we started working in the studio with Jeff. I started watching a lot of YouTube videos and YouTube I, university, best place yes. to go. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Spent a couple mon- months at Icon a yeah. couple of years okay. ago. Yep. Yeah. And I just have been slowly, you know, learning how to make the music that we want to curate for our sets. And um very grateful for Jeff's help um, it's a great teacher a great teacher he is and we could sit in the studio together and like you know have inspo tracks of the direction we want things to go and we could kind of sit there with him and talk about how we want things to sound and he's like a wizard he is so fast it would take yeah. me six months for something that takes him two days you know but well I'm doing... doing it since he could like work a keyboard you know so. yeah, yeah. I think absolutely he wears for him yeah so it's been a long time yeah um, yeah and quarantine like definitely facilitated a lot of that like learning and set building especially because we were doing two live streams a week and yeah two 
brand new sets that we had to make every single week. And so I think that that helped us find out really quickly that we don't have to like follow any sort of outline, mm -hmm. like pre-written outline. Like if we want to play 15 different types of house music in the same set like yeah just make it work <laughs> that's kind of what we do too we take all the music that we love to just listen to on a regular basis and we like put it all together into like a festival friendly curated set and I spend a lot of time in Ableton making like mashups and edits almost every song in our set is an edit the um, name of the game yep yeah. yep this, you know, the little sections of it and blending things together that normally wouldn't sound quite as good if you didn't make it into an edit. So, <laughs> yeah, that's been really fun for me to learn. And um, I don't know. I have a lot of fun doing it now. Yeah. With you. She's an edit wizard. Like, she'll be like, OK, hold on. Let me just edit that real quick. <laughs> like, go to the bathroom and I come back and it's done. <laughs> and it's done. And I mean, I always I teach like a few students production and I think edits are like one of the best first ways to really get yourself in the DAW because like if you're spinning tracks and you you understand song structure and you know builds and drops and where that needs to you know be in sets of eight measures at a time and then we're looking at 32 and 64 depending on the genre like if you yeah. just take multiple tracks and then like you're in Ableton or whatever DAW you work in and you very slowly start to see oh well just kind of like how I'm DJing I can EQ this out and I can side chain this and oh now I can make it my own by chopping up this vocal it's a great way to get yourself excited and like not be like oh my god I can't fucking do this this is like banging my head against the wall we're like producing and I feel like in my production journey you're 100% correct when you cross over to that other side I was kind of like when you guys were in COVID and you guys had to do so many different sets which is wonderful and I think DJing is an art and craft in itself. And I think if you can count to four, you can DJ, but that doesn't mean you can put together a great set. And that doesn't mean you know how to crate dig and actually make things flow from one PPM to another or a minor to a major key. And like, especially when you're on just like these massive stages, when you get up there, you don't want to be worrying about what you're spinning. You want that to be like the time that you devote to your like fans and festival goers and like have the time of your life and put on a great show. Um, it exactly I was a resident DJ and like doing that doing those sets every week even though it's like so tedious and at times you're like oh my god I wish I just had one headline set or I had one touring set for the year and I could time code these visuals it really yeah. like makes you practice like you were almost in the DAW and when you kind of cross over into production it's just this whole can of worms and you figure yeah. out how deep the black hole goes and how many yeah. options you have. And there's an infinite way to do X, Y, and Z the same exact way. And then like when you start to learn the craft of production, then you have to like hone your craft and hone your skills and then choose what you actually want to sound like and what you actually want to do. It's a whole like process and journey. And I feel like so many people, you know, don't, understand that through and through and I think that's the beauty of it because it does at one point like have you guys kind of felt like wow this is amazing and super fun but this is like also like low-key a job and like we have to do this yeah. have you guys ever kind of like blocked that road oh, yeah. yeah oh definitely oh it feels like a job sometimes when you know I'm having a good time at home and <laughs> like this weekend, I'm having such a good time at home and it's been so nice to be back with the animals, but we're going to Atlantic City for the weekend to play a pool party. So we're channeling our inner ratchet and we're putting together a set, you know. The show is great. I'm excited for the show. I just like, <laughs> I hate travel days, you know, where you're just like in the airport, mm -hmm. everyone's in your space, in your bubble, and you're just like, this yeah. is the work. This is like the clocking in hours that I'm like damn it I it is <laughs> work yeah the sets though playing yeah. the show I love it so yeah. much like it's so fun and I like you said it's it's fun to have an idea at least of what you're gonna do and you know yeah. curate the structure so that you can give your energy to the crowd and you can dance and be really into it and not like, you know, paying attention to what yeah. are you going to do next? Because mm -hmm. then it's really hard to dance and get into it when you're like, I don't know what I'm going to play. I'm just looking and trying to find the right thing, you know. 
I feel like it's really hard to have a good stage presence and like really connect with the fans and either at your show or the festival or wherever you're at. It's harder to connect with them if you haven't like prepared a set. Yeah. Because you're so focused on that and it sort of takes you out of the party itself. Mm -hmm. So like just putting your basic A, B, C, D, E, F hot cues in there is going to like help so much for them to be able to see that you're actually having a good time too, you know, like with them. And what they don't see is like the 40 hours it took before the show making edits and putting it all together and not only paying attention to key, but energy level on the transition. And like, you know, the next song, like a, you know, an A minor might go into an A minor, but the songs don't work, you know? (laughs) So you got to, it's all about energy flow as well. There's so much to think about when you're putting this puzzle together, yeah. you know, but and then I play it for her and then she plays it for me because it sounds different when you're mixing it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like sometimes it's nice to just be the listener. So I'll just lay on the ground and listen to Emma play the set, you know, <laughs> I love and... that. I, I love that. I, I wish like sometimes I had that because I think you not being in it all the time gives you a different perspective when you're able to just like listen and actually get like real true feedback from someone who is just as invested in the set or the project or the Ableton session as you are. But Mm. I, I think that's something that you're like, I think Ophelia just in general stands out amongst like a huge amount of labels and families because you guys are just so much like a family. Like you're so supportive. You're so, and I've heard it from Sam. I've heard it from Jason Ross. Like You guys all give feedback to each other. You guys all are like honest and like want the best for each other. And sometimes it's hard to find that in the electronic dance music community. Yeah, for sure. I feel very grateful because we do have a chat that um, group chat and I can send some of my demos and ideas over to these guys. And they're like, you know, they'll give me their honest feedback. And I really appreciate that because it means a lot coming from people that are doing so well. They obviously know what they're doing and it's. (laughs) great to have their advice you know yeah I think I'm able to progress a lot faster in my production journey having all these guys to talk to and that's been really really great yeah super grateful they're they're not they've they're never like macho like sort of cocky about it either Mm -hmm. they're very like into helping us learn yeah that's the best thing about it I think we're all in like a field where you're never gonna like get to a point where you're not learning and and that's what I think makes it so amazing and just like touching on what you were saying earlier you know it's hard because what we do is like so much fun and I think from the outside people look in and it's like this is a dream job which it is but it's like just like if you were working in real estate or just like me working in marketing like there are parts of any job that makes it feel like a job. We're just fortunate enough where like when you get on stage, it's all worth it. That's the same thing with me. I like travel days are fine. Thankfully, I can sleep on an airplane. But when you actually get to the show and you play the show, you kind of reflect and you say, okay, totally worth it. That's yeah. why I'm here. Um, I would love to know kind of how you guys work as like a duo dynamically like everything from just kind of like working and like creative processes like are one of you guys more kind of like prone to work in Ableton and somebody maybe does more of the mix downs or DJing wise do you guys kind of switch back and forth like how does that kind of picture lay out with the project yeah um I I think I'm more like technologically savvy so I (laughs) like yeah (laughs) I do more of the production. Emma's more of a songwriter. Um, she works on lyrics for some of the songs and um, also the fashion sense. That is not love, me. Love. <laughs> Emma's very good with that and the the direction of like the brand idea and the visuals and stuff like that. Um, obviously, we collab on those things, but it, a lot of it comes from Emma's artistic brain when it comes to design and stuff like that yeah I can design visually really well I don't design sound well at all so luckily Courtney really does and she has the ability to sit and listen to the same loop (laughs) until well and you know like I'm over here like I gotta go I can't listen to this anymore (laughs) (laughs) that's the funny thing about producing too is because when you finally get something out you've heard it 5,000 times and you never want to hear it again and now I hate it 
for it. And you're like, ah, oh, I have to really like something because now I'm going to have to hear it for every show I play, like <laughs> forever almost, you know, until you recycle it. But it's funny because like kind of like social media, people only see the best part of this career. A lot of people think this is the dream career. And obviously, when you go to the party and you see the set and it's just a fun, awesome time, that is the best part of the career. There's a lot of um, things like you mentioned, like the travel and going back to the hotel room afterwards and everything being quiet and your ears ringing and you might be alone. And it feels very weird to go from this crazy party back to being alone and traveling alone. Thankfully, I have a partner, but not everybody does. And it yeah. can be a very lonely business as well. So it's fun to have those those moments of like, this is all worth it when you get to go up there and share that with people and dance together, yeah. you know? Absolutely. And do you guys, I mean, I think just at the end of the day, it's it's amazing how, you know, your strengths kind of work with each other's, you know, not so strong parts, because I feel like you know, and just what you said, where everybody kind of sees the best part. I also think we're just in such a time and we've been in this time for a number of years where it's so much more than just the music. And I wish that wasn't always the truest statement, but like the fashion matters, the brand matters, the visuals matter, the big picture matters. And there are teams of like 10 that do what you guys just do together. And like, that's lovely that you guys are able to like compliment each other in that way. Do you guys do pretty much everything together? Like, are there any, cause I know there are some duos out there that, you know, one person's playing in New York city and another person's playing in Austin, Texas. Do you guys do that at all? No, we, we (laughs) might, (laughs) we we Emma did (laughs) on tour cause I got sick and I had to come home cause I didn't want to get everyone else sick. So Mm -hmm. she had to play. A five or five shows five show run by herself, and that was herself. probably really scary because I've I've never done that, mm-hmm. and it probably is a little bit scary being up there by yourself. It's intimidating. Everyone's looking at you. I kind of I get to lean on the fact that maybe everyone's looking at Emma, so I can just dance. No. <laughs> you know, I just think that then I'm not as nervous. So, <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was it was it, definitely like like the first night I played without her I came back to the bus and I don't remember who was on the bus at the time but I was like whoa like mad respect to all of you who are doing this by yourself because holy shit I cannot do I feel like my stage presence and performance was like cut in half like I I didn't feel like I gave fully because 50 percent of that was like like not there yeah yeah (laughs) yeah um yeah I was like well mad respect I was like well people uh (laughs) people who are single artists yeah do it it's it's definitely I feel like it's a lot like at least on my part it's a lot of pre-planning it's a lot of like I I totally and again that's why I always say because you always have that one person who comes like oh DJing like is an art and like yes like freestyle like open format DJing and getting up there and like literally not knowing what you're gonna play and just going for it is so amazing and I personally don't really think that happens in like the live commercial touring kind of melodic bass like dubstep circuit too much but I know it happens in like tons of like clubs in New York and Jersey and Chicago and especially a lot more in like techno and like prog house and like stuff like that but Mm -hmm. in my like realm I just know how I perform best and that's me knowing with maybe minor tweaks if I really see the audience is just like okay this isn't it I know my set from front to back I know when I'm singing I know when I'm doing this transition I know when I'm gonna break and talk and I feel like that's a way that I've been able to overcome being like, oh, there's tons of people out there. Kind yeah, of. Yeah. I mean, and you have stage fright. So right, doing those shows yeah. alone is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not like Beyonce and Lady Gaga go out there and they don't know what they're doing. You know, mm-hmm. it's very planned to the second, everything. And I feel yeah. like if you're going to play on these big stages, it's, st- it's absolutely still you. I mean, it all came from you. It's just a different way of doing it than yes. freestyling and we'll go to clubs sometimes and freestyle together it definitely happens but if we're 
you know, if we're playing a big festival, we're not going to go freestyle. We're going to know what we're doing. I'm not going to yeah. chance that. Um, yeah. Like, no. bombing it, you know, like I'd rather have a good time and be like, I'm at this festival too. I want to enjoy myself as well. So absolutely. And I think that's like so much of the fun part of it. And, and in addition to that, you still have so many things that could go wrong in addition to oh, yeah. already having your set prepared, like the emergency yeah. loop, the USB not loading. Like, have you guys ever had any situations or shows where like some crazy shits happened and you just were like oh, yeah. what was that kind of deal first time we played on cdj 3000 <laughs> and we didn't load our settings when we got up there because we didn't know how they worked and we got an emergency loop on almost every song none of the cue points loaded so i couldn't skip through things we had to play songs out that i would have never played out yeah. like it was kind of a mess and we were pretty I Pretty walked sad off stage that day. crying for yeah. sure. It was ugly. Yeah. It was ugly. We've gotten better since then. Like we know how to you bring a second flash drive always. <laughs> always. <laughs> always. Settings. Always load your settings. Yeah. And I never have made that mistake again. It's one of those you do once. But see, I'm really concerned right now because I've never loaded my settings. And thankfully, <laughs> I haven't had an issue. But now this concerns me. I'm like, okay. But I also feel like I keep my like record box up to date and like I keep all the firmware updated and everything. But just like CDJs in itself, there's so yeah. many little updates that happen with the CDJs and not like record box that when like you plug in, like you can see if something's off. You're like, ooh, this like doesn't look right. And you know, it's just in those moments where, yeah, you have your backup USBs. Like I always say, it's like lovely that we can travel with like at most maybe in ear monitors, but just a backpack and a USB because most people are not that lucky. I mean, yeah. Sam, like core yeah. stories, losing the, the guitar, core <laughs> stories. Poor guy had to play with a guitar hero guitar at some club I can't remember really oh, yeah like recently I was like Sam what is going on here <laughs> yeah. yeah he keeps an air tag in his guitar case so he's like I don't know how the hell it got to like Pennsylvania when I'm in Orange County <laughs> so, oh my god that's like yeah. terrifying it's terrifying and it just it sucks because you can do everything you possibly can and then yeah. even still not everything is always going to go perfect and I think that's like that that is like I I feel in my personal journey something that has been really hard because you can prepare as much as possible you can have everything ready to go and something can still go wrong whether it's a delay it's not your, it's not your CDJs you're playing on yeah so mm -hmm. you show up and you hope that they don't have some bunk ass broken ones because <laughs> sometimes that's been the case you know yep. yeah yeah. And, yeah you never know in like in the sun in the hot sun because sometimes we play day sets. Um, they melt they like heat up and we get emergency loop and all kinds of crazy shit happens so yeah, yeah. But, I mean the good thing is just always what are you gonna do four of them you know four you remember of them you on your tech writer and you should be sure. good you should you should be good you should it's it's you know gotta love technology at the end of the day we wouldn't have a job without it which is lovely right. yeah. um like just laugh about it when you mess up because we're all entertainers and like people just want to see us having a good time so you know, it happens. And like, if you mess up, whatever, kind of laugh it off and be like, oh, that was really bad, but we're going to move on. <laughs> we're going to move on. You just have to like smile and wave. And the quicker yeah. you lose that look on your face, the quicker, like everybody's going to go, okay, we're on to the next thing. Like, okay, we're partying. We're having a great time. Cause at the end of the day, I feel like I've played some club sets before where I'm just like, man, I could be playing the same song on a four bar loop and this shit would still be like popping. Like, I don't know if anybody would notice anything different. Yeah, true. For sure. So I know you guys have been doing, you know, obviously what I said at the beginning, the Seven Lions tour, big shows, big venues, lots of dates. But then you've also had, you know, the dynamic contrast of doing headline shows that are, you know, smaller cap intimate venues. Do you guys kind of have different sets when you headline versus like when you're opening a room and kind of like setting yeah. up the show and everything? Like, how do you guys go about that? Because I know you're in the Prague house, kind of tech house lane, melodic house, um, you know, just give me kind of like a lowdown on it. That's a good question. Yeah, um, we definitely have. We definitely make it for our smaller, more intimate club 
rooms definitely more vibey more groovy and then we usually always will do like the last 20 to 30 minutes of drum and bass just only on our headlines just to like yes you know pretend we're a drum and bass dj sometimes (laughs) (laughs) well i like to bounce around to that yeah i think (laughs) emma does too the crowd seems like they do but we like more melodic drum and bass like dimension sub focus and stuff um yeah I love it so much. So it's beautiful. I mean, it's amazing to see it starting to build here. Mm -hmm. Like it is. But we'll play, you know, we're going to a pool party this weekend. So we're going to play more like funky, groovy, Fisher type house kind of stuff. You know, but we will always have our melodic moments in there because that's that's just our thing to like have these breakdowns with beautiful vocals, even in like a housey set. We'll add stuff like that. But for a festival, it'll be, you know, faster moving, a little more like euphoric moments with like big vocal moments and stuff like that. Maybe some more techno. Yeah. Um, I so always, they definitely change depending on where we're at. I always like to <laughs> throw in um, who if we're like opening for an Ophelia act, I always like to throw in like a remix of one of like a houseier remix of one of their tracks, whether it's like Sam's or Jeff's or Jason's or whatever. Um, I always ask them first, but <laughs> um, I always like to throw that in there to sort of like round it together because I don't think people think oh, I'm going to this like melodic dubstep show, but like there's a house opener. So I feel like I like to mar- marry the two to be like, see, we're here too. Yeah. We can yeah. do that a bit too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how we work with with that. And a little heavier on the bass house when we're in Ophelia shows just to Mm -hmm. just to get them pumped for we gotta keep up with the boys. They're so fast, you know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Definitely is so heavy. We gotta keep people engaged. And we do mix quickly. I think we do that because of the Ophelia guys and how fast they mix and trying to keep up with the short attention span of these some people in the crowd you know especially at festivals you have to keep their attention so we do mix kind of quickly for house artists but it's kind of our thing and maybe it's my ADD a little bit too but um (laughs) no but I think that's great and like me personally I'm at a point but I was at a point as like a lover of electronic music like before kind of crossing over to the other side where if I'm hearing and I think Ophelia does this on their run of shows very well where you're not hearing the same shit for like five hours but a lot of bass and melodic bass shows that's what happens you have four or five artists that are all phenomenal producers but they're all kind of in the same like box where like maybe you'll have a little bit of a sub genre change and maybe there's some you know side trance songs or there's some this or maybe a little bit of drum and bass but predominantly we are getting the same style of music for a very long period of time and I think that like on the techno and house side they do like a beautiful job of building like an actual like dynamic kind of range of like hitting the headliner with the climactic point not like getting to like an excision and you being like oh my god there's been mosh pits for seven hours I'm already (laughs) dirty like I'm ready to go home I need McDonald's kind of deal and (laughs) and so I think that's great and I mean I think it's because I know you guys usually play like a little bit earlier just because Jeff always has like these crazy acts that he tours with I feel like every time I see the Ophelia tour happening like since COVID it's like headliner 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 (laughs) and and it's lovely it's it's really cool and you know I would love to know kind of speaking on Ophelia how you know were you very familiar with most of the Ophelia guys like pre-COVID family twitch stream hangs or did you come out of COVID with like a new so-called family per se, where you really felt like you bonded with these other artists, you know, on the label, like Jason and Kill the Noise and Blank and all those guys. Well, I've been touring with Jeff forever. So okay. I've been very like close with um Jason and Midas. I've been touring with them for years and Jake as well, Kill the Noise. And so I already knew them really well. Um, Sam, I sort of, we sort of got to know Mm -hmm. a little more over the years and that 
yeah he's rounded out the family so he's a hoot he is so funny and he's just Adam (laughs) he's so cute too love him yeah but Sam's like one of my really good friends now um we've all become really close like playing all these festivals and these Ophelia stages and stuff over the years I think every show we play with them we get a little bit closer we learn a little more about each other and it helps to have so much in common. We have the same lifestyles. When we don't talk all the time, nobody's offended. We understand that we're like so busy doing all the things. <laughs> and yeah, um, we did a lot of the live streams, like the vision festivals that we did. Um, we were like, it was funny, but we hosted it. We'd be like, and next up we had. <laughs> oh, I remember. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> so all we in the studio, like a little yeah. space that, that's there. So are you guys in the same place where the studio is at or is it in a different area yeah it's downstairs yeah yeah well, there were two different ones because we had well I guess three we did the brunch in our kitchen we did the regular live streams in Jeff's studio and then we went to a different studio for the visions ones because um it was better to have help from a professional live streaming Mm-hmm. team and that way they could like add the dancers in the bottom of the screen and like you know have the green it's screen so garbage playing behind it and I like there's no way the three of us were doing that independently <laughs> so, no yeah now I remember downloading Soundflower when like this all started to happen and I was like I really have to learn something else in tech that I do not want to <laughs> fucking learn like now we have to like download this I have to go in my settings I have to learn how to be a Twitch streamer. I have to do this. And it was very cool and like an awesome way to connect with people like from obviously all around the world, which you can't do with shows, which is awesome. But it was just this like whole other thing, but there was nothing better to do. It was like, do you want to still stay engaged with your fans? Do you want to still like hang out and do stuff? Like this is what you have to do. And it's a, it's a whole world. And I totally get why people have teams come in to do these massive live streams because there's so much that can go wrong and especially when it's like live live you're like oh well we're here and like in the matter of like five minutes you can like lose like thousands of viewers in your like chats and like all of this stuff yeah Yeah, for sure especially because we had like you know a couple of people were coming in from LA, like live streaming in from LA and Florida, New York, and like all these different Colorado, all these different places. I don't know how to like put them all into the Twitch stream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then like add the Discord. And I was like, uh uh-uh. uh. Like, yeah. It was a huge else. learning curve for us. Thankfully, Jeff is a pretty tech savvy. Yeah, um, he's very tech savvy. So he set up all the stuff for the ones in our kitchen. But if he wasn't setting those up for us, I don't think that we all would have done those streams. Because mm-hmm. Lord knows I wasn't learning <laughs> Streamlabs into Discord into Twitch. Yeah. Like all these things that like it was a little bit over my head. Um, So I was very grateful to have that because I think that exposure really launched our career. It helped people all over the world to see us. I think um, the Twitch performance. Streamers- now are glad we're gone but <laughs> you know like kudos to the the twitch gamers they really oh god to shit <laughs> they live on there too they you know it's crazy because it's like you've got like the keyboard warriors and i know you have it on like social media and stuff and like you deal with that but like in real life time like when you would have like people like raid your chat and then like all these people come out of nowhere and then you've got like bots and people are shit talking and like it's just a lot and then you're like literally live streaming and you're trying to juggle everything at once yeah I I I was happy when shows came back a hundred percent but we came out of COVID with like a lot of acts like yourself that weren't like you know nationally known and then it was like oh like I've seen them here and I've seen them here and now we're gonna get to see them in real life and it like really created this like hype out of just streaming and like not like ad ads or marketing or this or that you know totally and we still get fans that will come up to us and be like I watched every single Sunday for brunch and like you helped get me through things and like that makes me feel so good because it was really hard for everyone it was really hard to like hear from so many different people that we helped makes me feel really good yeah 
that's why we do it at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I think a lot of people I was speaking to um, Kayvon like a month ago or something. And he was just like, you know, you'll have some people who come up and they're like, you like saved my life for like this music, like, you know, like really helped me through this time, really did this. And we kind of look at ourselves as we're party DJs and we make music and we tour and we have fun and it's still a job, but it's cool. But we really often, I think, don't reflect on like the big picture of how it really helps some people. And and it's really, I think, especially in the circumstance with Ophelia, you guys just have such diehard fans that are clued into every single act on that roster, including the newer acts that release on the compilations and stuff like that. And I think that's what a label is supposed to do. You know, I think it's supposed to be you find quality, great music, you bring them into a household that has a dedicated listening and a dedicated, you know, following. And that's how you like create this culture. And Ophelia's done that really, really, really well. Yeah, yeah I think so too. I think and... they've done really well with like the love and inclusivity of the fans too, because something that I've like really noticed and I'm super grateful for is almost every single person I meet is really cool. Like a good, genuine, down to earth, just a good person, and yeah. I, I don't know if the whole scene is like that, and I think I'm very grateful that we landed in this realm of it because I would get a beer with everybody that comes to these. Like drinking with strangers is so fun. Everybody's so cute and cool, and <laughs> yeah. they bring little gifts and trinkets and stuff, and I don't know. It's been really cool to see, to hear of, I guess, the difference that we're making in people's lives and, you yeah. know, not to, and for us being gay also on stage, which I, that's not something that we like promote and is like this big part of our brand, but it's important to me that people feel loved and accepted in whatever they choose to do with their life, you know, is up to them. And I think, you know, if we can be, a, a bright I don't know you no know what I, mean. I mean I totally know what you mean and I think it's like whether it's your like sexual orientation or it's being a woman in the music industry or it's you know being you know trans or multigender or all of that stuff in between that we're kind of heading up in this current social climate and culture the more of us there are the more it shows other individuals who are maybe aspiring to do what we do or aspiring to just flourish in their own lane that, hey, you can do this and you can be open and accepted and, you know, turn your head to certain communities that are not as accepting. That's the beauty of electronic dance music. And I think as time has kind of developed, dance music is not what it once was when Jeff started and it was kind of this th place for misfits and people who didn't belong and people who just needed a home and a family where they didn't have one. It's become this very commercialized thing. And in that commercialized festival circuit or touring circuit, and you have the big conglomerates like Disco Donnie and Live Nation and Insomniacs, I think it, it, it calls for people like yourself and myself and I think of more kismet and I think of everybody in between, you know, to really just unapologetically be yourself. And, mm -hmm. and Ophelia has always been accepting of it. The people who I surround myself with are very loving and accepting, but I know that that is not what the front end and the back end of the industry is always consisting of. So I think it's just very, it's amazing that you guys are able to do what you do and kind of stand on a high pedestal because I think it shows other people that it's okay to do that and it's okay to be you and 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 not have to, I think, hold your words or hold your thoughts and just Ophelia on a forefront and Seven Lions. And, you know, I went to Seven Lions shows when I was 16 years old, when I was a baby. And like, he was one of the first people that like I saw and just to see it develop over time. And now like you guys are doing your thing. It's really cool, but it definitely like anything it's, it's thankfully, I feel like we all live in pretty 
I want to say kind of entertainment filled liberalized places that are pretty accepting, but not everywhere in the country is always that. And it's not right now. So I think it's, you know, what I just said more important than ever. And you can, you know, the one thing that somebody told me when I first started was you can't choose your fans. That is one thing that that you can't do as an artist. You can't pick and choose who decides to become a fan of you. But creating cultures where, same thing with you, I would have a beer or smoke a joint or hang out with any of my fans. Like, I'd rather have a smaller fan base that's full of good and accepting people than try and please everybody and go to shows where people don't feel welcome. Because that that is, unfortunately what certain venues and communities have right now that they're kind of fighting for to to change. Very well said. I mean, we've, are, we've like carefully even chosen specific clubs that we know will keep our fans safe. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we might be requested to play at a certain club that I've heard not good things about and guys do things to girls and things happen. And I'm like, nope, not going to put our fans in that situation. We're, we want them to be safe. And I care about people a lot. And I think it's important um, if you are unapologetically yourself, the right people do come around. And I think that's an important thing. They do. Yeah, they do. And you always have to be okay with not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody's going to agree with you, you know, and and especially now in the age of social media where your life is just, they want so much out of you. Every platform wants so much. They want posting multiple times a day they want stories every time a day like they want to see what you eat for breakfast how long you sleep and the best parts of your life and I think that it just kind of puts forth this like vulnerability and I understand why certain acts like zoo or you know other acts that have chosen to be more privatized and taken like a really artistic forefront to their project to keep their personal life separated is awesome but I also think that it's difficult as a woman kind of to do that. I don't know if it's like a a gender thing. I, I'm not sure, but I've never really seen too many women in our space, you know, escalate without sharing every little bit of their life. And <laughs> And it's weird. I was thinking about it the other day and you guys are obviously women. So, so it's, it's, it's kind of interesting where some people are kind of able to put on that mask, have that separation, but for girls, it's like, what are you doing? Who are you dating? Who are you seeing? Yeah. Tell me what you're wearing when you're oh, working okay. out. You know, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know that is interesting. And it, it's hard for me because I'm not naturally somebody that enjoys being on social media. I don't live every moment, moment of my life. Like I got to get my phone out and record what I'm doing right now, you know, but the tour, I tried to be more aware of it. And we tried to be more active because it does help to show people that we're human and we can connect on a deeper level that way, but yeah, it's not naturally something I do. And that's why our social media has been a little quiet since we ended tour. Cause I've just been enjoying my life living out, you know, hanging outside with the trees and well, and that's what our gemmatory <laughs> socials are for. I feel like you're probably not going to see us at home unless we're like taking a picture in new merch that we have coming or something or Courtney's like really into a mashup she's making and she decides to film it because we're not really we're just not on our phones 24 7 and we're home we have like a steady routine and breaking that is detrimental to our mental health (laughs) so like really what we're giving people is our tour life and that's yeah kind of what you get if you're not like you know our best friends or like <laughs> yeah we just because we need me time too yeah you have and to you I'm just like consist of being on social media for me personally some no. people like it but I don't I don't scroll I check my messages that's pretty much it like oh, I want to know what scrolling. my friends are doing but <laughs> oh I'd be scrolling yeah I'd be scrolling <laughs> I know I do too I'll be like thinking I have to do something I'll be staring at something I have to do and then I'm like Lizzie get the fuck off your phone you've been scrolling for like 20 minutes like put it away and I think it's just finding what works for you and I think the biggest thing is you're always gonna feel like you're in a rat race race with social media like I I think that the people who have the social media bug and I know many of them and they're wonderful content creators and they're wonderful social media, you know, drivers for certain projects and all of that stuff. I 
don't meet a ton of artists that have that bone. And I think for you to write art in life, like you have to experience stuff. And if you're, I'm just someone where it's like, if I'm always on my phone, I'm not in the moment experiencing things. So then how am I supposed to like turn around? Like, I'm not going to go in my phone to look at a memory, to write a song. Like I want to, you know, embody how I'm feeling after the 14 or hike or after the trip to Europe and then come home and say, okay, how do we channel this to make the best art possible? And finding that happy balance on social media is like, for me, it's scheduling post. It's like you go in, you schedule, you know what you're going to do for the majority of the week. You try and, you know, TikTok will always be the bane of my existence. I'm so yeah. sorry. I can't hop <laughs> on the fucking train. I just can't do it. And <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> it's so I'm awkward for that. Nobody needs to see that. <laughs> right? Right? You're just like, oh, do you really want to see me like selfie videoing in the studio of a new song? Or do you just want to come no. see it live? Like, do you just want to come? You want to see me <laughs> sing along to my track? Just come watch me dance at a show. <laughs> yep. Exactly. And, you know. Again, it's it's finding a happy medium that doesn't drive you absolutely insane. It's always going to be part of our job. But I think that, you know, especially with us being touring artists, like that's the most important thing. You share your music, you share your tour recaps, you share your moments with your friends. And like, that's it. I, I don't think it really needs to demand much more if the music and the art is there. I think if you don't, if you are running off of, just like a brand or an image, like, yeah, social media is super important. And there are projects that take that approach that do phenomenally. But I think Seven Lions, again, and you guys are a great example. And so many Ophelia artists, like the art is there. So the fans attach themselves to the art. So the social media is just like, like a cherry on top of like the banana split Sunday kind of deal. It's not the end all be all. It's funny because um, when Jeff, first started touring I and you know this is like 2010 and 11 when Instagram was just coming up and Jeff was just like I hate it I can't do it don't make me do it and I was like you have to and he was like no I can't like he's never had a personal page yeah he's never had personal social media pages he doesn't even have a finsta like and I would tell you if he did and he doesn't <laughs> like <laughs> and it it's just, he's like, no, they're going to like me because of what I put forward, not because of like my, what I have to say on a screen. He mm -hmm. was like, I'm sorry. If they don't like me, then they don't like me. And he's I was been like, a lot better though. I think after the tour, he's like come out of his box a little bit. Yeah, he did. Yeah. I think the they tour. They pushed him and they, making videos. Our team so. definitely pushed him. But we were with, like, we had great tour managers and we have an amazing photographer who's been with us for almost eight years and yeah. she is really good at getting him to make light of the things that he does shout out Felicia do. shout out Felicia <laughs> I love that. she's really good at it so I think he's warmed up to it I think after seeing us do our little I call them just little doodles but our little <laughs> Instagram doodles mini mic talks yeah he was like okay I think I could you know have fun with it I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he's just been around for so long. It just didn't used to be a thing. Like, it just, yeah. did, you know, it used to be there, but it didn't used to be, you know, artists getting signed based on followers or based know, on, you right? know, That's so crazy. Yeah. I think the pandemic and live streaming changed a lot of us, too, because I was so awkward and scared of a camera before that. And I had to force myself to do it. So it changed me. It changed my stage presence too. Because if I could dance around and be excited for a camera, I'm, <laughs> I can really dance around and be excited for actual people dancing with me. You know, it's pretty awkward um, sometimes to show your personality on camera, I guess. It is. And then you have to like look at yourself and you're like critiquing every little part of yourself. And you're like, oh, I could do this better. And then you reflect and you say you're just saying thank you or you're just saying one word and you don't need to record it a million times to post it on your story. That was one thing with me. Just like take it, let it go. Take it, let it go. People are going to watch it for five seconds. Like don't spend more time on it because as an artist, there's just so much there's so much like time management and batching that you really have to be on top of in order for you to 
be effectively writing music from your home when you're home from tour and like you know do you guys only write when you're home or do you write on the road too because I've heard kind of both sides of that only when we're home we're not inspired on the road there has been a couple times where I like open my laptop in a hotel room because I have like a melody in my head or something but very very rarely my studio space is like a sacred space and everything's set up the way I want it I have my midi keyboard doing the little mouse thing is like (laughs) it's hard (laughs) yeah so yeah it is hard it's 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 like doable and I know people who write on the road like write hardcore and I'm like how do you do that because it's I'm the same way like maybe like a voice memo or like a, a just very like basic saw midi melody something like that edits for sure like remixes for sure but like conceptual pieces of music like ep or something like that no way in hell like i need to be home and focused and like actually be able to listen you guys also just released an ep this year right Yes. Okay. Remind me. It was Crownless. Yes. Crownless. Yeah. yeah. It has um Crownless, Waking Up, and Fatal Love. We're all a part of that EP, and that was really fun for us to put together because Jeff actually touched zero of Fatal Love and Waking Up, which was really fun for us to work on because mm-hmm. um a lot of the other tracks we've released, he's at least been a small part of it. Whether it's like the mixing process or mm-hmm. putting some extra elements to make it hit harder, because that's what he does. <laughs> Um, but he was a part of Crownless, obviously. You can probably hear that it's super crisp and clean. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. So, and you worked yeah. with Danny King on that, and she's a good friend of yeah. mine. I love her. Her her vocals are just beautiful. Um, so tell me about the EP. Like, inspiration, kind of was it just like, hey, it's time to write an EP? You know, did you guys feel like the songs really kind of work together? Or was it just like three singles that you were like, hey, we don't want to do three separate releases. Let's just put out a big EP. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of what it was, to be yeah. honest. We were working on Waking Up and Fatal Love for like a two, year, years. two years, probably. Yeah. We got, um, you wrote the vocal for Waking Up with um, Notel, mm-hmm. who is amazing. We Love met for her. the first time on tour. She's so sweet. And and um, Luma helped write that as well. Yeah, and Danny King actually sent us Fatal Love in a different key. And we had the demo of um, Waking Up, which it sounded different. We had like a Tiesto vocal, a Tiesto track. Yeah. Like something, we ripped a vocal and put it, it over. It was like a 2006 <laughs> banger. Like it wouldn't yeah. have gone off. We needed to revamp it. So she sent us a vocal and we were like, can you sing this in A minor? Because this actually would go really well over something that we're working on currently. And she re-sang it for us and it worked really well with the demo we were working on. And then we could kind of put it together and finish the track that way and, you know, do the vocal production, finish it out. And they all were kind of their own separate tracks, but we didn't want to do singles. So we just put it together as an EP and it actually kind of worked. So yeah, that's kind of how that all came together. But it's fun because we have like, you know, Crownless is kind of like a I don't know if you would even call it techno, but kind of. It's just a banger. And then <laughs> it is. It's fun to play. Waking up is more like a melodic techno progressive and fatal love is more housey. So it kind of has like a little sprinkle of all the different things we have in our sets. Yeah. Which is fun. I love that. And yeah, you always like I feel like you can write and I'm sure this applies in your genre as well. You write like records and then you write like tracks and bangers. Like I feel like there's such like a dynamic kind of difference where you're writing something to go off in a live space where everybody's going to lose their shit and then you're writing a song that like people are really going to like make memories to and listen to in the kitchen and listen to on their you know road trips and all of that stuff and I feel like it kind of touches everything which is fun and considering you guys didn't really mean for it all to be together it does sound pretty cohesive which is it love lovely when it works out that way yeah and you can kind of hear we have a style and like I put more of my own production into Fatal Love and Waking Up than I ever have. I mean, my whole thing is like <laughs> stripping over a track or like when it exactly what you guys said, you know, listening to something a million times and then it's ready to come out. And there's always one or two or 10 or 11 things that you're like unhappy <laughs> with. And oh. and you say, OK, well, I just have to let it go. And then you go back and you listen six months later 
And I can't even remember what I was tripping over. Like, I just, it's like, okay, you're listening with fresh ears that aren't exhausted of the same sounds over and over and over again. And I feel like you listen to it like a listener listens to it because we're producing for people who love music, not other producers. And I think people get caught up in that sometimes where it's like, we have to be technically savvy and the track has to be 400 tracks and da, 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 da. And it doesn't always have to be that way. Like there's a, there's like a beauty and simplicity. And sometimes I think writing simpler melodies and like, you know, composed structures are harder than making something massive and then having to mix down everything on the back end. Oh my God. The mixing process was like the death of me. I swear. Like that was my first experience doing that myself, kind of like being a part of it and listening to it over and over and over. My ears would pick out things that I thought sounded horrible. And then I'd go back the next day and they were fine, but I already Ear changed. Fatigue it. is real. Ear fatigue exactly. is so real. Yeah. Totally. I it's- mean, I have so much respect for producers, so much more than I ever did before after learning the things I have in the last couple of years. I'm just like, Holy shit, you guys are awesome. (laughs) And I think it's also like, it's so hard to let go sometimes or make final decisions because coming from, and like what you guys said earlier, like you guys like kind of learned how to drum and, you know, learning guitar. And when you have only a set set of instruments, there's only so much you can do before you call it a day. But when you're in like a DAW and you have like Omnisphere and Phase Plan and Serum and Vital and what saw wave sounds the best and what layer sounds the best you can do so many things and spend years on something making a decision and like knowing when to just say okay it's done like let it out into the world that's hard because then you're like letting go of like this huge project of yourself where you've invested so much time so much energy and everything in between I think I think it was Chandler Layton that said something to me one time that will stick love her I love her. She's like, a song is never finished. It's just surrendered. And I was like, oh, I get that. Okay. I feel it. She, yeah. That's actually it, really good. It could be limit unlimited tweaks, like forever. And like you said, there's like, I mean, there's a limitless amount of things that you can put into a track to add frequencies and take them away. And, Surrender the song. Yeah. <laughs> so let it go you do you so do it's like ripping off a band-aid like you just have to say I'm done it's going out we're submitting it and it's over and we're on to the next um totally totally get that and it's it's always it's always so many things in your mind like oh like how are they gonna you know receive this how are they gonna feel about it and and at the end of the day you just have to write art for you and your project and then people can decide whether they like it or not and that's it and like that's their own cup of tea so what is next for you guys? Give me a little bit of a lowdown, like some of the cities and shows you're playing, like for the rest of the summer, any new music that we're going to be getting anytime soon. We're working on some tunes. We're really mm-hmm. excited about that. Um, A remix that I think everyone's going to really like. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you who, though. <laughs> yeah, we're... And- um some shows we have yeah. some festivals coming some up the, fun fall festivals the year's a little light because we played out most of the markets on the tour you guys have been um, all over I mean you guys have uh, been everywhere yeah pretty much everywhere yeah but we do have a, a few cities left so we have a few more shows left for the rest of the year and then we have some support shows for a couple acts that I'm really excited about some new people we haven't played with before um that I think is going to start a new connection, maybe take us down a little bit of a different route, which kind of goes back to like, we do curate our sets based on who we're playing with. So if we're playing with a little bit more of like a slower melodic progressive artist, our sets are going to complement that. Absolutely. Base house before they're progressive, but yeah, I'm Um, excited. Yeah. We have elements festival coming up. I've never been to, I think I've never been to. Yeah, but I've heard, um, I've heard great things about elements. Heard great things so far, and I'm excited for that. Um, we're doing Nocturnal. Pretty sure that was announced. EDC Orlando. EDC Cruise. That will be EDC, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we're back on Groove Cruise in January, which I'm I love Groove Cruise. About. My favorite in the world. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's like a mini Holy Ship when Holy Ship just used to be like a cruise, and it's just like. It's, I did a bunch of live streams with them during COVID 
And then um, they're just like such a cool family, such a cool, creative, like community that's. Yeah, the, it's it's a really good group of people like the. The people that choose to go on this boat, they're all very respectful. They clean up after themselves like there's not a bunch of trash everywhere. It's very clean and people are just nice to each other. They're very down to earth people. It's like one of the coolest groups that I've ever seen at a festival. Like almost every person is like just a great person, which is hard to find yeah. um, groups like that. So, and you're I stuck like on a, a boat. So it's like, it's a good thing that, that everybody's, you know, respectful and nice and kind. Cause you're correct. Totally not always like that. Um, okay. Lovely. I'm so excited to, you know, hear the new tunes and remix coming soon. And you guys have some new shows and some new lanes, which is all very exciting. It sounds like you're staying very busy, which means hopefully you're getting a lot of rest at home now, currently, like yeah, getting rejuvenated. Definitely. You have to, or you will so burn out. You will so yeah. just hit a wall and then like not be able to recover. Yeah. We're going to spend the rest of the night working on our set for the weekend because we leave at 7 a.m. for this show this weekend, but then we're back for a couple weeks, so I'm excited for that. Gonna hit the Ren Fairs. Yeah, no, we're gonna we're gonna have a good maybe rest Burning of our Man. Summer, yeah, <laughs> I want to go to Burning Man so bad. I live in Denver and I live in Rhino, and I'm like really close to this place called Beacon, which is like a Burning Man bar, which like I never even knew existed, and it's like one of the guys who like helps like curate some of the bigger kind of like activations at Burning Man and has been involved since like the dawn of time. And I feel like Burning Man's just like such an experience that you have to have, but you have to go with the right group of people. Like I've had the dance safe people kind of invite me because they have a car and then like Wednesday and Mad Girl and like all of those girls kind of have a car. And it just seems like something that is just like a life changing experience. Yeah, it definitely is. Yes. Yeah, it's it's definitely down the line going to be a full on commitment. But thank you guys so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. It was lovely chatting. And hopefully in the future, we will either play a festival together or meet at a show or something in between. I would yeah, love that. I can't wait. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I'm going to keep an eye out next time you guys are in Denver. Or next time Jeff is in Denver, I will message one of you and I will be like, we have to go get dinner. We have to yeah, hang out or go on a hike. Absolutely. Okay, ladies, thank you so much for your time. I hope you guys have a wonderful show this weekend and then a long, gracious rest period. <laughs> thank you so much thank for you. your time. Yeah, Thanks absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Have a good one, guys. Bye. Thanks. Bye. See ya.